Welcome to Airflow Management Awareness Month. My name is Al Zoldis, and I'm the president of Upsite Technologies. Today's uh, webinar is titled Airflow Management 101. Today's webinar is the first in a series of four webinars we are presenting during this year's Airflow Management Awareness Month. Our founder, Ken Brill, was a proponent and visionary for creating data center efficiencies to improve reliability, create redundancy, and reduce cost. Ken was also the founder of the industry think tank, the Uptime Institute, where they developed the tiered rating system for data centers. When Ken founded Upsite Technologies, the mission was singularly focused on helping data centers gain thermal efficiency by improving airflow in the data center. Those thermal efficiency gains could have significant positive improvements on the data center operator's capital expenses, operating expenses, and carbon footprint. It's no wonder that Ken was known as the father of the modern data center. In keeping with Ken's messaging, we launched Airflow Management Awareness Month to further educate facilities and IT professionals regarding the importance and the benefits of applying airflow management best practices in your data centers. Today's topic, Airflow Management 101, is presented by Lars Strong. Lars is our senior engineer and company science officer. Lars is a thought leader and recognized expert on data center optimization. He is also a certified U.S. Department of Energy data center energy practitioner and HVAC specialist. Lars is a frequent speaker at some of the top industry events. Some of his presentations and moderating topics have been how IT decisions impact facilities, designing, deploying, and managing effective, efficient data centers, myths of data center containment, understanding the science behind data center airflow management, data center cooling efficiency, and understanding the science behind the four delta T's. Without further delay, thank you for joining today's presentation. And I will now turn the program over to Lars Strong. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to be here. And we're going to make this as valuable for you as possible. A couple of logistical things. Uh, I'm going to just run through the presentation from start to end. But I encourage you to type in any questions that you have as we go through. Uh, this is titled Airflow Management 101, and I'm going to cover a number of basics, but also get into a few details, uh, f a few subtleties that, that not many people actually understand, even those uh, managing and improving their facilities. So if anything is not clear, I uh, really encourage you to ask questions, and, and then, of course, uh, there's the opportunity to follow up afterwards. I uh, have more detailed uh, discussions and uh, we'll be able to discuss the unique conditions at your site. So after being in this industry for 17 years, starting with Ken Brill and the Brill family of companies about 17 years ago, um, and spending most of my career focused on cooling optimization and airflow management in computer rooms, I can boil down cooling optimization to this, this first bullet point here. The goal is to maintain the appropriate IT equipment intake air conditions with the lowest possible volumetric flow rate of conditioned air, of cooling air, at the highest possible supply temperature. So in simple terms, use as little power as possible to keep the IT equipment happy. And the more airflow management that is done, the easier that is to do. And there's a lot of fallout benefits. Uh, including increased economization capacity, um, longevity of the site, deferred capital expenditure, deferred uh, uh, reduced operating costs. So while blanking panels and grommets to seal cable openings is not a very exciting topic and certainly not something that the C-suite is usually very interested in, it is something that even the C-suite should have an awareness of because the impacts are very far-reaching. Um, it all starts with the intake temperatures to the IT equipment. And ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has established guidelines uh, for IT equipment intake conditions. And they've worked closely with the IT manufacturers to uh, establish what are the recommended and the allowable ranges for intake temperature conditions. So you see here that uh, recommended, and they've broken the server types into classes A1 to A4, 
and then uh, B and C. Uh, what we'll, we see in data centers is the A classes. And so the recommended range is 64.4 is, uh, to 80.6. That means recommended intake temperature can be as high as 80.6 and the equipment uh, will still operate reliably. Allowable means that the equipment can have intake temperatures outside of the recommended range for a period of time and still continue to uh, operate at a reduced reliability level, but it'll still continue to operate. And what's important to note is that the different classes, uh, a lot of people, there's a misconception in the industry that, that they all have the lowest class, the most uh, uh, sensitive uh, equipment, and that it requires the lowest temperatures. However, most data centers now being populated with IT equipment purchased over the last couple of years will have a, a large quantity of A2 and, and even some A3 servers, uh, often unbeknownst to the data center managers in the IT department that, that procured them. Uh, it's just the way a lot of IT equipment is being, is being built. So these, this equipment can handle extremely high intake temperatures and, and still operate. Uh, so a lot of data centers are moving in the direction of raising temperatures. Um, that's a somewhat controversial topic. Uh, higher inlet temperatures does reduce reliability, but when you do the math, uh, it can be a very small increase in actual failure rates, especially given uh, that the IT equipment is refreshed pretty frequently. Um, I'm having trouble advancing the slides for some reason. Hang on just a moment. Okay, so I imagine most all of you are uh, calculating your PUE, and I want to take a moment to relate PUE to airflow management, and uh, just review real quickly what PUE is. Very simple uh, calculation. It's simply the total load divided by the IT load. Uh, however, in a mixed-use facility, it can be hard to uh, come up with the, I, the, uh, the total load supporting the data center portion of the building. In a standalone facility, it's really simple. It's just the total load of the entire facility divided by the portion that goes to the IT load or the, the UPS output. So in this example here, this pie chart represents the total amount of energy consumed by a data center. And this is for a PUE of about two. And in that case, the IT equipment is going to consume about half of the power. So the total divided by half would be two. And what's really important to notice here is what percentage of the total and what percentage of the non-IT load is devoted to cooling. So we see that uh, the mechanical plant and the cooling fans represent 35% of the total load. And a, and a whopping 73% of the non-IT load, whereas electrical losses and uh, electrical distribution and conversion losses only represent 10% of the total or approximately 20% of the non-IT load. So while it's important to improve the efficiency of uh, electrical equipment, you don't get nearly as much bang for the buck uh, to reduce PUE and reduce operating costs um, as you do by improving the cooling efficiency. And the best way to prove cooling efficiency is by improving the airflow management in the computer room. Let's take a moment to look at configuration in the computer room. Uh, this is the way a computer room should ideally be configured and the airflow set up. In this uh, obvious cold aisle, hot aisle configuration, uh, all the cold air is delivered to an aisle where the faces of the equipment face that aisle. Um, so we have two vertical planes of IT equipment intakes facing the cold aisle and all the exhaust air from the two rows goes into the hot aisle. And uh, this is ideal, but uh, it's not the way every row and every room is set up. Uh, the legacy 
configuration for cabinets in, in computer rooms uh, was in this fashion, where it was all facing in one direction. Uh, there's a few different names for this, legacy configuration or, or uh, soldiers marching. And basically, this was an aesthetic decision. They wanted all the pretty side, all the pretty blinking lights facing one direction so that during tours and various things, uh, the room looked good from one side. Um, but obviously, every, now, every aisle now becomes both a hot and a cold aisle, and there's a lot of mixing. There's still a number of rooms in, in the industry now uh, that have at least a portion of their room uh, still configured in this way. Um, it's not all gone, so important to be aware of and uh, do what you can to improve this condition. Work towards getting into, into a hot aisle, cold aisle configuration. However, just because you've gotten the equipment laid out in a hot aisle, cold aisle configuration doesn't mean that it's efficient. This image shows how poorly placed perforated tiles uh, that would be a tile placed in a hot aisle or an open area releases conditioned air into an area that is full of exhaust air. That cold air mixes with the hot exhaust air from the IT equipment and then returns back to the cooling units. Uh, unsealed cable openings release conditioned air also most often into the hot aisle. The only place where conditioned air should be leaving the raised floor plenum is through the perforated tiles in the cold aisle. So I'll take a moment uh, to go through some of the data that just shows how uh, well our data centers doing this in the industry. Um, this is data from 45 sites that I've viewed around the world and it's important to note that a number of these sites are 50, Fortune uh, 50, Fortune 10 companies even. Um, some of the biggest companies in the world with deep pockets and with the knowledge in their, in, in their company um, are still not doing it as well as they could. There's still a lot of room for improvement. And uh, we'll look at a few of these metrics. You see the range of raised floor area there, um, number of cooling units in the second column. But where it gets really important is the bypass uh, open area, the raised floor bypass open area, that third column there shows that on average, 48% of the holes in the raised floor are open areas where the air released does not contribute to the cooling of IT equipment. The best site had 13% uh, bypass open area, and the worst site, 93% of the holes in the raised floor, the air coming out of them was not contributing to cooling IT equipment. And I'm going to explain this concept uh, more and touch on it a couple of different times as we go through the presentation. The hot spots in the computer room, on average, 20% of the cabinets contained an intake temperature in excess of the desired maximum. That's the definition of a hot spot. And then I started looking at cold spots, which is any intake temperature below ASHRAE's minimum recommended of uh, 64. So a number of data centers are still over, have very low supply temperatures. And a low supply temperature means uh, that the site is inefficient. There's a direct correlation between the range of intake temperatures and the efficiency of the site. We'll talk more about that concept also as we go on. Perforated tile placement is one of the most basic ways to manage airflow in a computer room and so every single perforated tile should be intentionally placed. Every supply tile, every grill, uh, whether directional or not, should be intentional uh, and not just to also distribute full rows of uh, supply tiles down the cold aisle. They may not all be needed. So on average, 77% of the tiles were, were placed um, properly. There were only six sites where 100% of the tiles were in the right lo location, not a single tile in a hot aisle or open area. You know, I'm, I'm sure a number of you have experienced uh, being in a computer room or working for a data center where there's, there's supply tiles that are out in an open area 
or perhaps perhaps right near the uh, door to the computer room so that when somebody opens the door it feels cool just to create a perception among people uh, who just poke their heads in to take a look. Um, that's one reason, but it's it's not a valid reason, and it's an inefficient way to run a site, of course. This last column is a really important one. Cooling capacity factor is the ratio of installed and running capacity to the estimated heat load. We'll talk more about this also as we continue. Uh, it's a very simple number to calculate. It applies to when the fan speeds are running at 100% as many sites are. A lot of sites are switching over to variable speed uh, drives on their uh, cooling units, but a number still are at uh, full fan speed. And so this just shows that there was, f on average, four times more cooling capacity running than IT load. And ideally, that number should be about 1.2 or 20% extra, but not 400% extra. So a, a lot of opportunity for improvement. All right, we'll get into some of the science here a little more closely. Bypass airflow is a widely talked about concept, um, but it's often misunderstood. There's bypass airflow at the cabinet level, but there's also bypass airflow at the room level. And at the room level is what's most important to consider. So in these next three slides, they represent either a small room or, or uh, all the infrastructure in the room is condensed down into these two rows of equipment and this one cooling unit. And the arrows are sized and the numbers next to the arrows represent the volumetric flow rate or the cubic feet per minute, the, f the flow rate of air through those different locations. So we see that in this room, all the air moving through all the cooling units, there's 10 units of air. And it doesn't matter whether it's cubic feet per minute or liters per second. Uh, it's just a, a flow rate. And the relative uh, quantities are what's important uh, to learn from. So we have 10 units of air moving through all the cooling units. And if 10 units goes under the floor, we add up all the air that comes out of every opening in the raised floor, we're going to get a total of 10 units. And in this example, we have air coming out of unsealed cable openings under the rows of cabinets, and that's a total of six units of air, leaving those openings. And that air is wasted. It's bypassing its purpose in life. Uh, it's not passing through IT equipment and picking up heat and carrying that heat back to the cooling units. It's simply coming out of the floor and going back to the cooling units. So we have six units of air doing that. We have four units of air coming into a cold aisle, and uh, supplying the IT equipment in that row. So this row consumes a total of two units of air. This row, the IT equipment consumes a total of two units. So the IT demand in this case is four units of air. We're supplying four. And if all the airflow management is done well in this aisle, then that may be sufficient. We've got just enough to meet the demand of the IT equipment. So we look at this and we see, absolutely, we should seal these cable openings. The misconception is that by sealing those cable openings, we are then reducing or even uh, eliminating the amount of bypass airflow in the room. And that's not the case. We're just shifting the location of where that air comes out of the floor. We still have 10 units of air going under the floor. And now all of that air is coming out into the cold aisle. But the IT equipment still only needs four units of air. It sucks up what, it's need, what it needs. And now we have six units of bypass airflow leaving the cold aisle and returning to the cooling units. So sealing the cable openings does not eliminate bypass airflow, but it allows you to uh, set up the room in a way where you then can uh, reduce the amount of bypass airflow by reducing the total amount of air moving through the cooling units relative to the amount of air moving through the IT equipment. The amount of air moving through the IT equipment is independent of the amount of air moving through the cooling units. They're, they're totally separate. Um, for the most part, the amount of air moving through the cooling units, uh, through the IT equipment is, is pretty s consistent. There are some variations on occasion as uh, equipment ramps up and ramps down, 
but in a fairly large size room those tend to to level out even out and and there's a fairly consistent demand of IT equipment so by improving the airflow management either with blanking panels or ceiling cable openings we can then more closely balance the amount of air moving through the cooling units relative to the amount of air moving through the IT equipment have a little bit extra to deal with those variations in uh, demand of the IT equipment and to overcome a little bit of uh, airflow management uh, deficiencies and uh, reduce operating costs and also recover stranded capacity. We've now recovered five units of, uh, of airflow that as we add more cabinets that's available and the, the fans can be uh, increased again. So that's bypass airflow uh, in a nutshell. Now let's talk about another concept, which is delta T, the change in temperature through various locations in the computer room. I'm going to spend a few slides on this because this is really uh, in, uh, provides some great insight. And it's something that you can easily measure at your site and uh, find out how much opportunity there is for improvement. So delta T is simply the change in temperature. And if you ask a facilities person, what the delta T is in the computer room to tell you it's the change in temperature through the cooling units. If you ask an IT person they'll probably talk about the change in temperature through the IT equipment. Um, both are true, those are locations where the temperature changes in the room, but there's actually four. Uh, there's two other locations and the two others are really important to notice uh, and measure because they're uh, what give you the greatest insight. So here's location one, the change in temperature through the IT equipment. Air goes in the intake, warms up, carries the heat out of the server, and returns it to the cooling unit. Here's the other common delta T, the, the temperature drop going through the cooling unit. But then two and four, these other delta T's, are, they should be very close to zero. There's really no reason that if everything is done well that the air should warm up from the time that it leaves a cooling unit to the time that it gets to an intake of a server. And there's really no reason that the air leaving a server should cool off before it gets back to a uh, cooling unit. However, it does. So here's, a, let me show you an, another picture of, of what's actually happening in the computer room. Um, we have the change in temperature through the cooling unit and then it warms up substantially. There's still a lot of data centers out there where the supply temperature is in the high 50s or low 60s and yet intake temperatures to the IT equipment is in the high 70s or uh, even sometimes in the low 80s and so the obvious reason for the air warming up is that hot air has mixed in somewhere either come through the cabinets over the tops of the cabinets around the ends of the aisles and mixed in with this cold supply air before it got to the intakes. And then we have the air leaving the servers and it comes out often near 100 degrees and yet return air temperatures to cooling units are often in the uh, high 60s, low 70s and so that's another uh, very substantial uh, drop in temperature. Comes out at 100 and returns say even at uh, 75 degrees uh, that's still a a substantial drop. These other delta T's, the change in temperature from supply to intake and the change in temperature from exhaust to return, these should be uh, around five degrees. It's kind of the point of diminishing return. Ideally these would be close to zero um, and in some sites the, they are very close to zero. Uh, with the more containment the, uh, installed then the better the balancing of the airflow, the closer these temperatures will be uh, to zero. So the goal is to get as close to five degrees as possible. And uh, really easy to go measure those temperatures 
and identify where you are. If you can get your site into the uh, five degree range, then you know you're going to be in the top 20% of efficient sites uh, in the world. Uh, not very many sites are, are getting there, but uh, a number have been able to do this well. I'll show you a couple of uh, nice infrared images that that put to uh, light uh, the often invisible conditions in the computer room. An infrared camera, by the way, at least an infrared thermometer, is a, an essential tool for managing a site. And in this picture, uh, this is a infrared image taken of the return to a cooling unit. So this is the filter on the top of a cooling unit, and it shows the air temperature returning to that cooling unit. There's a portion in the middle that's at 85 degrees, and then all around that is a bunch of 10 degree colder air, 74 degrees. Um, this is bypass airflow returning to the cooling unit. And so this just shows how the air in the room doesn't mix. That we can have some nice hot air coming from a hot aisle, and we have some cold air coming from supply tiles or cable openings that didn't pass through IT equipment, and it all returns to the cooling unit. This image shows an extreme example of what a lot of people, a lot of data centers do to try and overcome poor airflow management and high intake temperatures. So we see that in the tops of these cabinets, there's uh, high intake temperatures. Uh, ASHRAE's recommended range is 64, which is anything blue, green, and green. Blue to green is within ASHRAE's recommendation, and anything uh, warmer than that, anything uh, yellow and orange is a high intake temperature, is a hot spot, and anything cooler than blue, all of the bottom half of these cabinets, is a cold spot. So the only intake temperatures that are in ASHRAE's range are this middle portion of equipment down the row. So. The problem in this data center is, isn't that there is not enough cooling capacity. The problem is that the capacity is not managed well. There are many cable openings under this, these cabinets releasing conditioned air, so there's not enough coming into the aisle to meet the demand of the IT equipment. And they tried to overcome the hot spots by turning the thermostat down, and all that does is make the temperatures colder for the bottom uh, equipment. So the solution in this picture is to seal the cable openings and more air will be delivered into this aisle and you'll see all this cold air rise up further to meet the demand of the equipment and now everything in the aisle will be too cold and then the supply temperatures can be increased to recover that capacity. Another aspect of bypass airflow, of, uh, sorry, of uh, the delta T is the change in the temperature of, in the room, is the concept that every kilowatt of electricity consumed by IT equipment becomes a kilowatt of heat added to the flow of cooling air through the equipment. So, um, and there's, a, there's this fixed relationship between airflow, temperature change, and heat energy. And when we simplify the heat transfer equation for the units that we're familiar with, uh, we come up with this equation. And if you know any two of these three variables, the flow rate, the change in temperature, or the energy, the heat, uh, then you can calculate the third. And the way that this uh, plays out is that if the delta T through a more modern high density piece of equipment is say 35 degrees, then it needs 90 CFM, 90 cubic feet per minute of conditioned air to cool one kilowatt of IT load. However, if the delta T through the IT equipment is only 20 degrees, then 158 CFM of conditioned air is required to cool one kilowatt. So this can have a big effect on how much air is required um, for different cabinets with different delta T's and, uh, and should be considered in the procurement of IT equipment. We can use this information to calculate uh, the bypass airflow in the room. We have uh, the 
UPS load and if you take the UPS load and you multiply it times the average flow rate per kilowatt required to cool IT equipment, you get the total IT equipment CFM or the total amount of air moving through the IT equipment. So if you have a UPS load times say uh, an average of uh, 150 uh, CFM per kilowatt, you get the total IT demand. You take the total cooling flow rate through all the cooling units and you subtract the IT cooling demand and you're left with the excess or the room bypass airflow uh, rate. And that can be a, a pretty simple task to complete and can really give you insight into uh, how much opportunity there is for improvement. This is another way to get at the exact same thing that is revealed by looking at the delta T's, the other delta T's in the computer room. So the, uh, the more bypass airflow there will be, the more the exhaust temperature from the IT equipment will cool before it gets to the cooling units. So let's go through a few metrics. Um, Paramount, the reason a data center exists is to provide reliable power, connectivity, and the right environment, continuous cooling. So IT intake air temperatures are paramount. Uh, they should be as even as possible. The goal is to have a variation of less than five degrees from the coolest intake temperature to the warmest intake temperature. Uh, again, this is something very easy to go walk through the room with an infrared thermometer or an infrared camera and uh, identify um, what the warmest intakes are and the coolest and, and see how big that range is in your facility. And then possibly moving perforated tiles around and uh, looking for opportunities for improved airflow management um, to uh, make the intake temperatures as even and low as possible. And then uh, intake temperatures should be as high as possible. ASHRAE recommends as high as 80 degrees. There's various reasons that uh, you don't want to go to 80 degrees. It might be a colo and your SLAs uh, require you to keep the intake temperatures lower than that. Various other reasons, but uh, as high as possible for your facility. Raised floor bypass open area is a metric that you can calculate. It simply requires somebody with a flashlight, a tape measure, uh, knee pads, and, uh, and a clipboard to go measure every hole in the raised floor and add those up and find out what percentage of the holes in the raised floor are bypass openings and what percentage of the holes in the floor are area, open areas that are uh, from supply tiles. There should be less than 10% of the open area in the room uh, should be uh, bypass open area. It, it gets pretty hard to get it to zero, but getting below 10% is the goal. Uh, I'll take just a moment more to explain that. So in a raised floor environment, if there were only two holes in the entire raised floor, one was a 12 inch by 12 inch cable opening, that would be 12, uh, one square foot of bypass open area. And the other was a standard 25% open area perforated tile in a cold aisle. And uh, that's 25% open area of four square feet. So that's one square foot of holes in that tile. So you have one square foot of holes in a cold aisle and one square foot of cable open area that room would have 50% bypass open area and 50% good open area. Uh, so that's how that's calculated. Rack open area. There should be none. The goal of, of sealing up the vertical plane across the intakes of IT equipment should be complete. It should be to seal every opening in that face, meaning blanking panels in every open space, and the space between the rails and the side of the cabinet, if that by design is open, those need to be sealed completely so that the only way air can pass through the rack is through the IT equipment. Bypass airflow is a metric that is very valuable to calculate. The goal is to get it uh, to approximately 20%. It depends on the conditions of your room, how large your room is, a number of, of variables, um, but uh, 
have a look at that and uh, you might find that uh, you're, you're not even close to 20 percent that you're probably uh, 100, 200, 300 percent of uh, the required airflow through the cooling unit. So lots of room to improve there. And I want to point out though that if you calculate bypass airflow and you find that you, you have uh, three times more air moving through the room than through the IT equipment, uh, it doesn't mean to turn off cooling units and right away reduce fan speeds. That much airflow, excess airflow, may be required given the level of airflow management in the room. Meaning, without blanking panels and without doors on the ends of the aisle or without baffles over the tops of the cabinets, you might need that much extra air to keep all the IT equipment intakes happy. But as you improve airflow management, you put in low cost, airflow management solutions, then you can reduce the flow rate and you can raise the supply temperature. Cooling capacity factor, that's the metric I spoke about near the beginning. That's the ratio of the rated cooling capacity uh, to the estimated heat load. Again, that should be about 1.2, not in the uh, threes and fours. We have a calculator on our website that can help you calculate this, or I'm happy to uh, discuss this with you offline as well. So I've got a substantial list of best practices here. Uh, each of these could be a topic of conversation for quite a while, um, but I wanted to give you a, a good substantial list. We've touched on a number of these already. All racks in uh, hot aisle, cold aisle configuration. There's one caveat to that, which is if they are fully uh, contained or ducted cabinets then or uh, chimney cabinets, then that's not as important. Um, but in general, all cabinets in a hot, cold aisle configuration. All IT equipment mounted to breathe front to back. This is really crucial. We see a lot of equipment getting mounted um, backwards so that it's uh, breathing in the wrong direction taking air in from the hot aisle and exhausting uh, air into the cold aisle. So this requires you know, good coordination between the IT and uh, facilities uh, departments in the, uh, in the company. Seal all openings in IT racks, of course. Make sure that vertical plane is buttoned up tight. Seal all openings under the racks. Make sure the only hole in the raised floor is uh, is a supply tile in front of IT equipment. And of course, locate perforated tiles in only appropriate locations. Make sure the location of every supply tile is intentional. Uh, aisle in doors, get a lot of bang for the buck by uh, installing doors at the ends of the cabinet rows. Another best practice, of course, is to raise cooling control temperature set points as high as possible. And this doesn't necessarily mean raising the intake temperatures to the IT equipment. By raising the, uh, by improving airflow management, you can uh, increase the supply, the control temperatures, without increasing the IT equipment intake temperatures. And then expand the relative humidity range. This is a, you know, opening up a, a big topic. But uh, many sites are, are going to a wider range, which uh, improves free cooling and, and reduces the cost of, of humidification and dehumidification. Right, we're, uh, we're coming to the end here. We've got a few more topics to share with you. To, to navigate this whole process, we've developed a concept called the four R's of airflow management. And it breaks the approach into uh, these, these four areas that uh, you want to look at the rack and make efforts to improve airflow management through the racks. And then you can look at the, the row level, uh, spaces between cabinets, um, doors on the ends of the aisles, and, and look at the row level. And the raised floor, make sure all the openings in the raised floor are managed. And the important point of this and, and how this graphic represents this is that after an improvement is made, say by improve, in, installing blanking panels in all the open spaces, uh, you need to look at the room level and make adjustments to the controls to be able to realize the benefits, realize the savings from that airflow management improvement. 
We've got a link here to uh, a video that we put together, and it's about a three-minute video, and this can be real useful to explain the whole concept of airflow management uh, to senior people or people that are just getting started uh, with the concept. This slide just shows you know, the various areas, uh, the concepts that we've talked about. It's here so that uh, if you download this presentation and, and want to share it with others, uh, you have a good description for each of these four areas of improvement. So what do we do? We use our depth of knowledge in data center uh, research and, and optimization to develop innovative products that are very simple to use and help achieve these four outcomes. And it's really important to know what uh, the motivation is for somebody you're talking to, even internally. If you're talking to senior level people and trying to explain why you want to buy some blanking panels, you need to know whether they care about cost or reliability or OPEX, um, because then you can speak to them in, in the language and, and with the motivations that, uh, that are important to them. We have four family lines of, of products that address the four R's. So we've got our cold lock line, and many different options of ways to seal openings in the raised floor. I want to point out uh, probably the least known solution, which is the extended brush, comes in two foot or five foot lengths for, for great flexibility in sealing very large openings. Uh, we have the hot lock line of products. Our newest addition to this family is the switch fix, which helps balance and, and get the air to switches that are often mounted in the backs of cabinets or with uh, side intakes. We have the aisle lock line of products, and our newest member to that family is the magnetic under rack panel, which installs in seconds, of course, just by slapping it on and the magnets attack, attach and and seal uh, the space under cabinets. Really important uh, to address that area as well. And then Energy Lock is our uh, monitoring line of products to make sure that you are getting the information you need to, uh, to manage the room. Uh, we have both wired and wireless options, uh, hundreds of self-sensing, uh, self-identifying sensors, and uh, industry best leak detection uh, sensing rope. So we're just about done now and uh, ready for questions. If you've, if you've come up with any, please uh, be typing those in. These are the, we have three more webinars coming in the month of June for Airflow Management Awareness Month. Uh, in one week, we'll be talking about the state of the data center and, and how the changes that are happening in the digital evolution are affecting airflow management and how to uh, address that and be ready for all those changes that are coming. Uh, we'll have a great uh, guest speaker, Bill Clayman, who's going to be joining us to uh, discuss this topic with me. Then on the 21st, we're going to be discussing uh, the ins and outs, the pluses and minuses of hot and cold out containment, which is best. There's a lot of misconceptions and, and uh, confusion around hot and cold out containment, and we'll, uh, we'll clarify that for you. And then on the 28th, we'll be talking about the virtual facility for data centers and how uh, engineering simulation, CFD modeling, can be extremely valuable in uh, getting the best utilization possible out of your site. All of these videos will be available uh, on our website uh, for reviewing later and uh, sharing with others. And, uh, and here is my contact information. I uh, encourage you to get in touch. If I'm not able to answer your question you know, right now, uh, happy to have conversations with you later. So uh, we'll, we'll take some questions. Okay. Uh, our first question uh, is, uh, what is the ideal temperature set point so it does not cause the fans and servers to increase their operation? Ah, uh, great question. So yeah, I made a statement that said, supply make intake temperatures as high as possible. There is, however, a point at which the server fans sensing the higher intake temperature um, will speed up and fans consuming a lot of energy 
can actually erode the benefits of raising the temperature. So that's where you know this question is coming from, and and where that sweet spot is is somewhere between about 75 and 80 degrees. I mean, one of the reasons that ASHRAE picked that 80 degree upper limit is that that's the point uh, where a lot of servers speed their fans up and start consuming more energy. Um, for some equipment, it's a little lower than that. Um, so it's somewhere between the 70 and 80 degree point is uh, is the highest you can go without causing the server fans to increase their, their fan speed. However, um, some people are going way beyond that because even though this server fans speed up, they're able to use outside air free cooling and the benefits of using 100% outside air outweigh the downside of the server fans increasing, and so they're they're going to higher higher temperatures than that. I hope that answered that question. Okay, then we've got one that uh, I have a lot of problems with the cooling distribution in my DC. Is it recommended to install additional fans in the perimeter of racks inside, outside, etc., around the IT equipment? What do you think about additional fans, and what also do you think about AA type N rows? All right, another another really good question. A, a lot of sites that start having problems start adding fans to push the air around, and um, these can come in the way of just you know standalone fans sitting at the ends of the row, or in some cases fan assisted tiles. Um, I would say that about 80% of these methods are unnecessary. That it's really important to first address the fundamentals of airflow management, sealing every opening in the raised floor because when you stop the air from coming out around a cable conduit, that air now has to come out of somewhere else. And if the only place for the air to come out of the floor is supply tiles in front of IT equipment, you're going to get more and more air with every every bad hole that you seal, you're going to get more and more air coming out of the locations where you want it. Um, so that's the first thing to do and and then again within the cabinets. Um, it, it may be necessary in the short term to install a fan someplace until you've done the basics of airflow management, but it's not going to be, in many cases they won't be necessary if you do the raised floor airflow management well and you do the cabinet management well and uh, potentially you may, need, might need to install doors on the ends of the rows. And then, and only if all that's done, uh, it, would it be justified to keep adding fans or add in-row cooling, additional cooling capacity, or add additional cooling units around the perimeter of the room when you just simply have more load than the cooling units are capable of supporting. Um, so, don't know where you're at, where your site is at. Um, we can look at a couple metrics uh, offline and determine whether you need to buy more cooling capacity, uh, be it in row or perimeter. Uh, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, uh, or whether it's just a need to improve the management of resources you've already got. Okay. We've got one here. What are your thoughts on cooling solutions that use only PODs or contain solutions with only heat exchangers connected directly to the chillers? Uh, there are a lot of different uh, solutions, uh, rear door heat exchangers, um, direct liquid cooling. There's lots of different solutions that are coming out now and uh, they all have merit. They all have potential um, for doing a really good job of, of getting the heat out of the room, uh, particularly liquid cooling in some form or another. And uh, I'm going to start sounding like a broken record here, but uh, even those require managing airflow well. So if you have a rear door heat exchanger, you're still moving air through the cabinet. It's still an air-cooled uh, server that is taking the air through the server and then the heat is being pulled out of the air by the rear door heat exchanger um, uh, before the air goes into the room. 
Uh, if it's direct liquid cooling, there's there's a lot of different versions of that. Um, then air becomes a little less crucial. Uh, there's still often some components that have uh, a requirement for air moving through the box. Um, but uh, yeah, those are very valid solutions. Um, but only again if everything, all the fundamentals have been addressed. Okay, this next one's a two-parter related to end of row doors. One, are there any doors to fit six foot cold aisle widths? And two, any doors to fit two rows that are not aligned, one row longer than the next row slightly, approximately one to two feet? Uh, yeah, there are a uh, number of solutions um, for both the small and the large. You know, of course, one of the earliest uh, solutions on the market was the meat locker curtains, which of course are obviously very flexible and can be configured to any size, but they have many, many uh, downsides to them, of course. Um, there, uh, we have a solution that is uh, for four foot aisles, and we are in the development of solutions for smaller and wider aisles. Uh, so news about that will be coming in the uh, not too distant future. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to helping those customers that have those wider aisles because wider aisles are becoming are becoming more prevalent um, either because they need to just distribute the weight uh, or there's a perceived need to have wider aisles for more perforated tiles, three rows of tiles. Uh, that's, that's pretty unlikely to be a, a valid driver, but for various reasons, you end up with six-foot aisles, and, and yeah, they, they do need doors. All right. Uh, any overhead containment solutions that don't interfere with fire suppression, overhead sprinklers? <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the current re, uh, regulations require that if there's a full roof over, a, over an aisle and the sprinklers are not ducted, or not, uh, not ducted, if the sprinklers are not uh, down inside that uh, roof, then the roof has to get out of the way uh, when a uh, smoke detection occurs. And uh, that's, a, that's an expensive proposition. That's a complicated solution. There are a number of sites, even sites running very high densities, that are not using full roofs. Uh, they're very often not required. A baffle is often all that's required to prevent air flowing over the tops of the cabinets, um, either the hot air escaping or the, the, I mean, the hot air flowing over from the hot aisle and going down into the cold aisle. It's usually what you're trying to prevent. Um, we have a baffle solution that is either angled or vertical uh, for appropriate um, uh, applications for cold aisle or, or hot aisle, and the a small baffle is often all that's necessary. Um, I know of a site that is doing 50 kilowatts in a cabinet. They of course have doors on the ends of the aisles, but they just have baffles over the tops of the cabinets. They don't have full containment, and they're able to um, support 50 plus kilowatts in in cabinets. So. Um, yeah, if you have a full roof, there's a lot that you have to do, but in most cases, it's not necessary to have a full roof. All right, uh, last one is, uh, if we haven't done anything, where should we start? And related to that, uh, where do we get the biggest bang for the buck? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. The, the, the best place to start is at the cabinet level, at the rack sealing every open space in the cabinet. And this is true whether you have a raised floor or a slab environment. It's really important to get blanking panels in every open space, and it's really important to seal the rails to the sides of the cabinet. Uh, we have a solution for that, a rack airflow management kit for sealing the rails. Um, that's, that's where we've seen in a lot of modeling and being on site and making improvements. Um, so being an engineer and, and doing a lot of remediation myself, doing a lot of simulation, 
I've found over and over that, that you get a lot of bang, um, you get a lot of improvement in intake temperature and the capacity to reduce fan speeds by sealing that vertical plane at the intakes of equipment, making sure there's no gaps in the rows uh, between cabinets. And then um, the uh, second place is to do the floor. Make sure you seal the openings in the floor and then start putting up containment. Uh, put doors on the ends of the aisles and by the way, that gets you rough numbers somewhere around 80% of the benefit is just getting doors on the end of the aisle uh, give you, you know, 60, 80% of the benefits of full containment because you get no wraparound and then you can balance the flow rates of conditioned air um, supplied to the aisle with the amount of air demanded by the IT equipment in that aisle. All right. Okay. Um, we've got... Uh what is the threshold uh, limitations for installing the aisle lock uh, for improving cooling? Um, the it's four feet for the aisle lock uh, bi-directional doors. Um, if it's if it's a question about maybe somebody can clarify as I'm talking. If it's if the question is about how wide of an aisle it is, it, it's four feet. If the question is how big of a room. Um, there's there's no limit you know the, the as big as a room as there is improving airflow management throughout the room improves the efficiency of the site um, this is also touches on a really important point that I'm glad it, it uh, came up here at the end which is when improving airflow management a lot of sites make the mistake of evaluating the improvements on a single row and miss that it requires improve, uh, implementing improvements across the entire room to be able to realize the full benefits. Uh, so I, I hope that addressed the question and, and I'm happy to go into more detail on that if you'd like. Okay, we'll just uh, we'll squeeze one more question in here. This will have to be it. Uh, from what kilowatt per rack value do we need additional cooling in a cold aisle above 8, 10, and 12 kilowatts per rack? Considering that we uh, we we will consider containment and airflow management also. Um, the the question of how many kilowatts can you cool in a cabinet depends on how much conditioned air you can get to the cabinet. So uh, if there's a high raised floor and there are no obstructions under the raised floor and there's plenty of cooling capacity in the room relative to um, the uh, the total IT load in the room. So, in short, if things are done really well, you can cool very high loads in a cabinet. Like I said, air-cooled cabinets of 50 kilowatts are possible. It's extreme, but that's that's kind of in the upper upper limits. However, there's a number of things that that limit how many kilowatts you can cool in a cabinet such as raised floor height, obstructions under the floor, um, the type of tile uh, that you have, the, the open area of the tile. So the more open area you have of the tile, the less resistance there is for the air and the more conditioned air will come out of that tile. So if you have a high density cabinet and um, you're having a hard time keeping it completely cool, meaning you know the conditioned air gets sucked up by the bottom and, and the equipment in the top is is uh, getting warm, um, is on the warm side, then putting in a grill that has a higher open area or a directional grill uh, will get you the best you can get. Um, and beyond that, then you're going to need to start putting in containment doors on the ends of the aisles and uh, possibly in row cooling or purchasing more cooling units to get more air stuffed under the floor. So uh, appreciate the questions, uh, really uh, nice questions and um, again I'm available if you want to have any more detailed follow-up if I wasn't able to answer your questions uh, directly and uh, really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you on the uh, next events. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.